Okay. All right. Uh, we're live. Uh, welcome to the Pro Life Thinking Podcast. Um, you know, we're new here uh, doing this, uh, doing a video feed here on YouTube. Uh, this is kind of a new experiment for us. But um, yeah, if you're listening to us live, welcome. If you're if you're not, then we'll of course extract the audio and put this on our audio only podcast later. Uh, we have a, a special treat for today. We brought in Dr. Christopher Kayser. Uh, that is how you pronounce his last name. I have it on good authority. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to him here. Uh, Dr. Christopher Kayser, uh, oh, it even says rhymes with razor in your uh, bio, is a professor of philosophy at Loyola Marymount University. He graduated from the honors program at Boston College and earned a PhD four years later from the University of Notre Dame. A Fulbright scholar, Dr. Kayser did postdoctoral work as a federal chancellor fellow at the University of Cologne and as William E. Simon visiting fellow in the James Madison program at Princeton University. He was appointed a corresponding member of the Pontifical Academy for Life of Vatican City, a fellow of the Word on Fire Institute, and winner of a Templeton grant. He has written more than 100 scholarly articles and book chapters. An award-winning author, his 15 books include Disputes in Bioethics, Thomas Aquinas on the Cardinal Virtues, Abortion Rights For and Against, 365 Days to Deeper Faith, The Gospel of Happiness, The Seven Big Myths About Marriage, A Defense of Dignity, The Seven Big Myths About the Catholic Church, The Ethics of Abortion, O Rare Ralph McInerney, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, Stories and Reflections on a Legendary Notre Dame Professor, Life Issues, Medical Choices, Thomas Aquinas on Faith, Hope, and Love, The Edge of Life, and Proportionalism and the Natural Law Tradition. Dr. Kayser's views have been in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Huffington Post, National National Review, NPR, BBC, EWTN, ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS, MSNBC, TEDx, and The Today Show. And now he's gracing our humble little podcast here <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, well, welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Kayser. Thanks, Clinton. Nice to be here. Actually, I think we should say welcome back to the show. That's true. Uh, you do have the yeah. dubious distinction of being our first repeat guest. And also our first uh, visual guest on, on the YouTube broadcast. So, yeah. All so right. Back. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one, one newsworthy thing that's kind of happened recently is, of course, the uh, nomination and confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Uh, I noticed that you're a graduate of Notre Dame yourself. How, how do you feel about, about Barrett's confirmation, seeing as though she's a graduate of, of that university? Yeah, I'm delighted. We actually overlapped at the University of Notre Dame. So she was there. Uh -huh. We overlapped, I think, for two years. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a course in the law school with uh, John Finnis. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if she was in that course or not, but I wouldn't be surprised. So I'd like to say we were classmates, but we certainly were at Notre Dame together. And I'm very happy that she is going to uh, and is now a justice on the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Yeah. Um, we're very happy about that. Even my my pro life uh, Democrat friends are, are happy about her confirmation of the Supreme Court because of her originalist leanings, and you know we hope that that might uh, improve the situation regarding abortion here in our country. So we're, we're of course um, very pleased for uh, Amy Coney Barrett's nomination. Uh, and one other thing that that we came across before we get to the discussion on the book is uh, Phil Vischer, who people who grew up as Christians may recognize him as the creator of Veggie Tales. He has, he has a podcast himself and he's been doing some YouTube videos and he wanted to get involved in the voting issue and, and created a video about why he thinks uh, Christians should actually be voting Democrat. And uh, there are a, lot, a number of issues with his video, a uh, number of facts that, that, well, it wasn't necessarily him. He had, actually had a guest, uh, Sky. Jathani, I think is his name, who talked about it. But uh, a lot of the facts that he got were j simply mistaken. And a lot of the uh, the things, the conclusions that he drew from the information were, were faulty. So uh, we were originally considering uh, doing a video in response to it. But uh, the thing is that uh, I really didn't have the time to to really uh, delve into that and do the research. But uh, two, you know, one of my colleagues and uh, someone that uh, that I don't know personally, but I've uh, but I've seen a couple of his presentations have actually written responses to that video. So if, if you've seen it, uh, you'll probably be interested in the response. I think they do a good job of kind of dismantling the claims um, 
you know, it's, it's a good conversation to have. I'm glad Phil Vischer himself is very willing to, uh, to have this conversation, which is great. But um, uh, my colleague, John Ferrer, wrote a response to it and Frank Turek actually wrote a response to it too. So uh, rather than discuss that video on a podcast here, because, you know, uh, next week is when, uh, is when voting day is coming up on November 3rd. So, uh, you know, rather than just try to sneak in a, a video on it, we're actually going to post those two responses in the show notes to this podcast. Uh, and, and in fact, I've already have them in there on the YouTube broadcast uh, already. So, um, those will be there. It, you know, hopefully you can share those around it. When you see people watching the video and sharing that video, you'll have these two, uh, these two articles as responses to it. Okay, so uh, now to the meat of the discussion. Uh, we brought on Dr. Christopher Kayser because he has recently published a new book, uh, Disputes in Bioethics, um, which uh, I think was just, was just published this month, wasn't it? Uh, that's right. That's right. Okay, so yeah, um, you know, uh, we tend to focus on abortion more because it's kind of a, uh, you know, because it's a very pressing issue, but uh, bioethics in general has always been uh, of interest to me. So I, I uh, thought that this would be a good book to have Dr. Kayser come on and, and talk about himself to, uh, you know, to, not just to, uh, to bring some of the information out there to some of our listeners, but also to encourage you to go out and pick up this book, uh, which you can, you know, find on Amazon. Uh, you know, probably Barnes and Nobles, any of the uh, uh, popular their book sites. Um, so yeah, hopefully this discussion will encourage you to go out there and pick it up. Uh, so, uh, so Chris, one of the one of the questions I, I was having was considering that you uh, that you already wrote a book, The Ethics of Abortion, which focuses on abortion, and you also wrote a book on human dignity. What was it that uh, sort of inspired you to, to to go ahead and write this book, where you talk about bioethics more generally? Well, my work in bioethics is really ongoing. As, as I'm sure you're aware, there are constantly new arguments put out in the public square to justify abortion and infanticide and, um, and other such things. And so what the book was is really my response to uh, contemporary um, advocates for these positions. So I actually get in my email, um, not, not every day, but very often, the table of contents of various scholarly journals and in these journals, there's often arguments that are put forward that are new and distinctive about life issues. And so I've been uh, writing these essays, kind of um, critiquing some of these views. And so the book is really a, a collection of these essays. Uh, it's my own response to a number of contemporary scholars who have uh, defended the view, for instance, that uh, pro-life um, healthcare workers ought to be forced to perform abortions. And so, you know, basically the book is, is, again, responding to these contemporary critics and trying to show that um, the views they're putting forward actually don't have a sound justification if we consider them philosophically. Hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, obviously, this is not an exhaustive discussion of all the uh, potential topics you could, you could discuss in bioethics. What was it that... that uh, what was it about these specific topics that, that you decided to include these in your book, but not some of the other topics that we often hear about? Um, well, I'd like to say I have a master plan and that um, mm -hmm. there was a systematic reason why these were included and others weren't. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that actually wouldn't quite be right. So basically what I do is respond to things that I think are um, either new or important for some reason uh, or likely to be influential. So I kind of look at the top journals, basically. So things like um, the American Medical Association or the New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, these are very prominent um, journals, the journal called Bioethics. And so I kind of monitor those, especially for things that, um, you know, I think are really worth critiquing and worth responding to. Uh, so it, for instance, in the book, I look at... Um, this very interesting and new argument, you, you may have run across this before, but I, I was surprised because I'd never heard of this before. Now, since I saw this first article, I've seen other ones defending the same view. But anyway, the article basically was saying that if you're a Christian, you ought to celebrate abortion. And the reasoning is that if you're a Christian, um, you know, you are concerned about ultimate destiny, you know, heaven or hell. And so what happens in abortion is the abortionist 
uh, kills the child before the child can do any sort of sin. And so all these aborted children are sent straight to heaven. So if you really were serious about your Christianity, you wouldn't condemn abortion, but celebrate it as a great act of evangelization, sending countless souls uh, to heaven. And so I thought that was a really novel, and I'd never heard that argument before. And so uh, in the book, I kind of take that argument on and show why uh, that argument really, if you think about it uh, carefully, doesn't really work. Mm. Yeah, uh, Nathan and I were actually kind of talking about this before our broadcast, uh, just a few minutes before, where we were talking about arguments which kind of sound like trollish arguments, but are actually being supported by academics in the literature. The argument you just mentioned actually is one that I've actually seen fairly frequently, not from philosophers, but just from pro-choice people that I interact with online yeah. and, and uh, you know, at, at outreaches and things like that. People who don't have the academic training uh, will sometimes say, well, you know, Christians believe that... Uh, I should move these things back because I have a tendency to talk with my hands. I, I'm Italian, and so uh, <laughs> I want to make sure I don't bump into things. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I've, I've heard people say that. Well, you know, Christians believe that that uh, babies go to heaven, so you know, Christians ought to be supportive of it. And of course, that there there are certain rejoinders we have. Well, you know, obviously, we don't believe that we ought to murder someone after they come to Christ, uh, or you know, to, to prevent them from falling away, things like that. So it seems like there are these really really easy responses to it, but you, but you. Still wonder why people think that these are serious criticisms. So I, I am kind of surprised to see these kind of arguments being leveled by academics, uh, also. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, so let, let me go and give a, a quick overview of the book here, um, and then we can get in, in, into more of the meat of it here too. Because actually, so some of the some of the topics that you covered in the book, I actually thought were fairly uh, fairly unique. Like I, I haven't seen, and now I, I don't have, I haven't read like everything. Uh, all the books regarding bioethics, but some of these I, I thought were actually uh, not really interacted with much, uh, in, at least in the books. I, I, I don't know about maybe the academic uh, articles published in these journals, but uh, so some of the arguments you tackle, uh, the you know the argument from speciesism, um, you know, is is uh, caring about human life morally on par with sexism, racism, things like that. Uh, what is dignity? You spend a few chapters on on abortion and reproductive rights, and you. Uh, tackle antinatalism too, um, and then of course you have you have chapters on how we ought to to treat and respect children. Uh, some on euthanasia and assisted suicide, and then you tackle conscientious objection and uh, separating conjoined twins at the end. Um, I, I do find it a, a little odd. Now, yeah, you know, I'm not an academic philosopher. I, I consider myself more of like a philosophy popularizer because I, I write in blogs and. Uh, and, and give uh, talks to, to to audiences about bioethics, but I, you know I do confess to sometimes thinking that that bioethicists tend to tend to go too far with with their you know with, with their openness to investigate new ideas. And you know I, I'm a little I'm a little distressed that there's actually an open question in bioethics as to whether or not children have a right to be loved. You know, um, and and then of course. Uh, you talk about do children contribute to the flourishing of their parents and also should we permit euthanasia to children? But, you know, the, the very fact that we're actually asking the question, do children have a right to be loved, I think is just kind of kind of ridiculous. It seems kind of obvious that they do. Um, you know, I don't know if you have any any thoughts to offer on on why that would be an open question in bioethics. Yeah, uh, Richard John Newhouse had a, a quotation. I'm not sure I'll remember it verbatim. But he said something like this, that bioethics takes what's um, beyond dispute and debate and makes it debatable. And then they turn the debatable into the uh, legally permissible. And then they turn the legally permissible into the obligatory. So there's this long history of, of a kind of movement that bioethics, you know, starts off and says, well, you know, what about this extreme circumstance? Couldn't we do this or that? You know, the, these extreme circumstances and the debate begins and then sooner or later, it turns into a something that legally is permitted and then even, even required of people. So I guess what I'm doing in bioethics is trying to push back on some of these, uh, some of these tendencies. And as I indicated in the book, um, some, but not all of these um, critics really uh, make serious mistakes where I think anyone can see that it's, it's clearly um, erroneous what they're saying. A good example in the book is the uh, scholar who was arguing that we ought to have a right to 
kill the fetus even after it has been removed from the uterus and put into an artificial womb. And then he brings forward three different arguments that purport to show that um, we, we have a right to kill um, uh, a child when it's in the, the uh, ectogenesis, when it's in the artificial womb. And not one, not two, but all three of his arguments are logically invalid. So, you know, I think any professional philosopher can see that, you know, a logically invalid argument uh, doesn't, you know, show its conclusion. So even aside from the truth or falsity of the premises, even if both premises were true, the argument doesn't logically follow. So for me, at least, I, I, I think there's some value to pushing back on, on these sorts of arguments and trying to show that even though they may seem at first glance to be plausible or to be even irrefutable, that upon closer examination, it turns out that they're actually quite weak. Yeah. Have, have, by any chance, have you come across the term gestateling in your research? No, I haven't. Okay, because yeah, there's a I, I have a I, I have a couple of friends who are responding to an article from an academic journal where there's a philosopher who wants to start using the term gestateling to to, um, to describe a child who's been implanted into an artificial womb uh, because you know she thinks that uh, using you know using a term might be too emotional where we want to be as um, you know emotionally unattached as possible so we can philosophically reflect on how we ought to treat children who are are implanted into artificial wombs. Um, so yeah, I think I think this the terminological questions though are important because there's a mm -hmm. tendency among some bioethicists to deliberately use terms that dehumanize uh, the human being in utero. So, for instance, uh, using the term pre-embryo. Um, well, there really is no such thing as a pre-embryo. You have either eggs and sperm, or you have a human embryo. They don't. There's just no such thing as a pre-embryo. But the whole idea of it is to kind of dehumanize the human being in question, or a good example of that is also fetus. So the corresponding medical term for a woman is a gravida. But in you know everyday speech, no one virtually refers to a pregnant woman as a gravida. Only in a strictly medical context would anyone do that. Um, but we do, or some people do, refer to prenatal human beings as a fetus. And I think that's deliberate. I think it's an effort to dehumanize the one in question. And this dehumanization is something that takes place in many other uh, areas as well. You have racist people who use dehumanizing language about people of color, and it's deliberate. It's to make them seem like they're not fully human somehow. Uh, you had people that were against Jewish people, you know, using dehumanizing terms for Jewish people. And again, it's deliberate. It's much easier to um, advocate for legalized harm for others if you can make them somehow into the other the not fully human, the not fully a person, those that don't have equal rights to you or me. So I guess I would push back on this, uh, you know, on, on any term that would um, undermine and camouflage the reality of what's going on. Um, similarly, when people talk about abortion as termination of pregnancy, again, I think that's a euphemism. It's a way of camouflaging the reality of what's going on. Um, giving birth terminates a pregnancy, a cesarean section terminates a pregnancy. Uh, okay. But, you know, so terminating pregnancy is ambiguous. It's not, abortion is not just terminating a pregnancy. Abortion is, I think, better defined as the intentional ending of a human being's life prior to birth. And that's why, for instance, we speak of a botched abortion. If an abortionist tries to perform an abortion and it goes wrong and the baby's born, um, it's a failure on the abortionist part. His goal was to end the life of the human being in utero, and he failed to do that, so we call it a botched abortion. Uh, so anyway, I think it's important to be accurate and truthful about language, um, and so that's what I try to do in my writing and in my speaking. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so you do have a, ch a chapter here on do children contribute to the flourishing of their parents, and you know, I mean, I think the I think the whole book is is great. It's it's very uh, you know, it's in bite sized chunks so that someone can spend twenty or thirty minutes reading a chapter uh, and then come back to it later and not really miss a beat. Where they you know, uh, and so I, I really appreciate that. I do know uh, some people like Scott Klusendorf who actually said that he just read it in the sp span of an afternoon. Um, so it's very very accessible. Uh, it does get a little technical in some places, but very accessible to where you know you're not going to be struggling the whole way through. And so I, I really appreciate it for that. But I think the chapter on children contributing to the flourishing of their parents was especially 
it was especially good. Um, you know, I, I think it's a lot of things that people just don't really stop and, and think about. So I think that that chapter alone, especially if there are some married couples who are uh, a little reticent about having children because of the change it will it will affect on their you know, on their personal time or something. I, I think that um, I think that this chapter would really go a long way toward dispelling a lot of those those fears. And so I think that chapter alone is worth the price of the book, really. Uh, thanks, Clinton. Yeah, that chapter, I, I think, is um, in a way different some the, than some of the other chapters. So many of the other chapters are in, are interacting with uh, one or two critics of the positions that I hold, whereas that chapter was a little bit more uh, open ended, you might say. And it, it basically tries to make an argument that children are a great gift uh, for a married couple, that they really enhance, children really enhance the well being of the couple in significant ways. So I talk about um, enhancing in particular three ways. One would be through enhancing uh, and realizing the goal of erotic love. So if we think of erotic love as Plato did in the symposium, Plato thought that if you are in love with someone, you want to be as fully united as you can be with that person. And when you have a child with somebody, uh, that's exactly what happens, right? Part of you and part of that person become actually physically united and then in normal cases, you're also united in terms of a shared affection for that child, a shared emotional connection with that child. You hopefully will share in activity in terms of raising that child. And so what children do is really serve as a bond that unites a couple even closer together. Um, and that's why, as Aristotle noted, that uh, couples that have children are much less likely to divorce. There was actually a United Nations study that showed that couples worldwide that had no kids at all had about a 39% likelihood of divorce. And if they had a one kid, it dropped down to 24%. And two kids, it dropped down to 17%. And if they had four or more kids, they had less than a 3% likelihood of divorce. So children are, are really a kind of bond that, that brings a couple together and provides a kind of motivation for them to carry out their marriage vows. So the classic marriage vow is what? That I'll love you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health until death do us part. And as people who have been married for a long time know, that can be difficult, right? People get sick, people lose their job, there's COVID-19, there's there's all kinds of serious problems. Right. And when you have kids though, you have this extra reason to love your spouse. You have this extra reason to be faithful to the vows that you made because your life isn't simply about you and it's not even simply about your spouse and you, it's really about also the children. You know that whatever actions you take are going to affect your own children. And so you have this extra motivation, you might say, to, to try to really be a good husband, a good father, a good spouse. Um, so in that chapter, I, that's one of the reasons I, I give. But I talk about a number of reasons for thinking that children really are a gift to a marriage, that really enhance a marriage. And I think that most people actually, upon reflection, do feel that way. I, I know that there was a survey done of American women and at the end of their childbearing years, most American women uh, indicated that they wished they had had more children. So that's for not all, of course, but for most. So I think experience and hindsight really does give rise to this sort of insight that having children is uh, a very beautiful, significant, and meaningful thing. And for almost everybody, having a child is, if not the most important thing they ever do, at least among them. So you think about people that are like president of the United States, you know, that's a pretty important thing. But I think if you talk to President uh, Trump or President Obama or President Bush and you said, well, is, you know, being a father, is that important? Is that among your life's most significant things you've done? I know that they would say that, that it is, right? This is one of the most significant things that even if you're president, still one of the most significant things you can do. Um, so in the chapter, I'm kind of exploring the theme of of parenthood and what it and how having children really enriches the person who becomes a parent. Yeah, well, we did have uh, some questions about some of the arguments that you tackle in the book, which I'm guessing uh, you know a number of our listeners wouldn't be familiar with because they're you know really used in uh, the academic journals, and you know a, a subscription to those journals can be pretty costly. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn this over to Nathan, and he can go ahead and, and direct the conversation from here. Yeah, well, we've touched on a couple of chapters that were really, um, really great. And at least in a lot of books on bioethic issues I've read, I haven't seen anybody tackle those issues like 
should children be loved or do children contribute to the flourishing of their parents? So that alone, I think, is a really good way uh, reason to buy the book. I guess we'll take this uh, go chapter by chapter and uh, uh, talk about a couple of the chapters in the book. Uh, I think the one that will be on everybody's mind right now is your chapter is Roe versus Wade unquestionably correct, especially now that Amy Coney Barrett has been confirmed as of last night. So I guess we could just start there. And uh, if you want to, you know, just kind of give an overview of the chapter and then uh, talk about the argument that you responded to and then some of your arguments uh, that you make in the book. Yeah, so I, in that chapter, I'm responding to uh, Erwin Chimerinsky and a co-author whose name I don't remember, uh, who wrote basically an essay saying that, and in the essay, they said that they thought that Roe versus Wade was unquestionably correct. And I took aim at this article in part because um, he is a dean of the Berkeley School of Law. So he's a very prominent uh, law professor. And I was really frankly shocked by the uh, low quality of his contribution. Um, for instance, he in the whole essay, he has a grand total of a single uh, pro-life argument that he critiques and dismisses. And I just thought, this is really... Uh, hard to believe that after, you know, this is almost 50 years after Roe versus Wade, there have been many, many uh, book length defenses of the idea that all human beings, including the unborn, deserve to be respected and protected by law. And all this work, um, including books I've written, are completely ignored. And I just thought, this is just completely bizarre to write, you know, this, he, this article that I'm critiquing is very long. It's like, 57 pages or something. So very, very long article. And really to not engage at all with the opposition. So one way to think about it is, I think what he provided was uh, what I call the ostrich defense. So ostriches will like stick their head in the sand and just ignore everything. And then they think they're safe. But you know, an ostrich who sticks his head in the sand is not really safe because they can't even see what's coming and it doesn't really work. And so, yeah, if you put your head in the sand and ignore all the criticisms that have been leveled against Roe versus Wade over 50 years, well, I guess it looks pretty good from that perspective. <laughs> but yeah. the, problem, the problem, of course, is, uh, you know, if you take your head out of the sand and you look around, mm. there have been many, many arguments against it. For instance, um, he makes this claim, again, totally wrong, that all opposition to abortion is on the basis of a kind of faith or dogma or religion or the Bible, that is just 100% false. Again, I think of the uh, University of Kansas philosopher Don Marcus. Uh, and Marcus has a famous article called Why Abortion is Wrong. Marcus is an atheist. He is not drawing on dogma or the Bible or Christianity or anything like that. He doesn't believe God exists. But he says that killing is wrong for the same, well, he starts off with this intuition. Uh, why is it wrong to kill you or me? Well, if you got killed today, Clinton or Nathan or, or me, um, we wouldn't lose our past, right? No one can take away what happened to me in high school or what happened to you guys in high school. But w if I got killed today, well, what it would take away is my tomorrow and my next week and my next year. And the same thing's true for you. So I would miss out on the opportunity to enjoy all the good things of life, right? Friendships that I hopefully will make in the future, books that I hopefully will read in the future, uh, good meals that I'll hopefully have, movies I would enjoy. I would lose the opportunity for all those good things. And so one reason it's wrong to kill you or me is that killing us deprives us of an opportunity for a future like ours. But the very same thing is true of killing a newborn baby or of killing a prenatal human being. If you kill either one of those human beings, you deprive those human beings of the opportunity for a future like ours. In other words, they're not going to be able to grow up and have friends. They're not going to be able to go to the movies, uh, enjoy ice cream, you know, ride a bike, whatever it is that you like to do or I like to do. Obviously, you know, they're deprived of all those things. So the very same reason that it's wrong to kill you or me is also a reason why it would be wrong to kill a newborn baby or wrong to kill a prenatal human being. That is, it would deprive uh, it would deprive those individuals of the opportunity for a future like ours. And so, again, arguments like this are completely missing in Erwin Chimerinsky's uh, defense of Roe versus Wade. And so, basically, I, th I thought it was like completely inadequate. I, I mean, here's one way to think of it: 
Imagine somebody who wrote a 57 page article um, against affirmative action. And you say, well, okay, well, what, what critics of affirmative action uh, did you look at? And the answer is, well, none. <laughs> none, right? I mean, what? I mean, literally in the footnotes, there was not one pro-life author that was cited. Not one. I, I, I just I just think it's it's scholarly uh, malfeasance, right? To simply ignore yeah. every single yeah. objection, every single counter argument, every single author who doesn't agree with you, and just pretend as if they don't exist. It's it's really it was shocking in a way. Anyway, yeah. so that was yeah. uh, an article right. I enjoyed writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, isn't that something that? that the editors would have would have pointed out when he was trying to get it published like why would the journal publish an article that didn't uh interact with any of the critical literature um i think the reason is that um it was published in a law school journal and law school journals are edited by law students and at some law schools there are none or almost none or no or almost no people who would have a pro-life position so i'm guessing the people that read and reviewed that essay, I would bet you almost anything. They also were completely unfamiliar with any of the scholarly discussion and debate about this issue over the last 50 years. And so that's probably why they thought, oh, this sounds great to me. Well, yeah, I would if, if you had no understanding at all of the other side of the debate. But but again, I, I fault the professors because I think this is a, a dean. This is an established person and he ought to know better than to write an entire 56 page article or however many pages it is very long. I think it anyway around 50 pages uh, Without even taking into account any of the arguments on the other side. I just I, I find it uh, unbelievable Yeah, it's really doesn't speak very highly of higher education nowadays, especially for law school. I mean and it unfortunately I've found that to be the same across the board I was looking at a textbook for a bioethics class at my college and the only pro-life argument that in their they had three chapters on abortion. The only pro-life argument they even bothered to reference was the one you mentioned by Don Marcus, um, the future like ours argument. And I'm going, you know, you have uh, people like yourself, Patrick Lee, Frank Beckwith, Helen Watt, who've been published in the academic literature, and they're just going to ignore all that. I mean, it, it's that's not how you have a discussion. Um, so yeah, I. I really liked your chapter in responding to that. Um, you kind of gave, you gave a really good overview of the pro-life argument um, and kind of, uh, how should we say, you reviewed a lot of the arguments you made in your other book, The Ethics of Abortion, where you specifically focused on the abortion issue. Um, and then you also talked about uh, um, some of the other aspects of it. I know in the book you focused a lot on the, uh, the Catholic Church's teaching. Uh, you, were, you referred to the Catechism of the Catholic Church here. Um, in responding to, uh, I believe it was Chemerinsky and Goodwin uh, was the author that you were. Uh, That's right. That, uh, um, you responded to, and you kind of gave a uh, more of a brief overview, but you uh, really re uh, you really reviewed a lot of the arguments that you've made in other, uh, previous works. So it was a really good. Even that chapter alone would be worth the price of the book, because um, you really you re. Uh, you reviewed a lot of the pro-life arguments that you've made in the past in other books, but you get put it in a more uh, a way that was a lot more lay level, mm -hmm. uh, but also referring to uh, their works. Uh, so we can we can stay on that chapter if you want, or we can move on to another chapter. Um, I know the following yeah. chapter. Yeah, I think we can go ahead and, and move on because uh, okay. there's 17 chapters, so obviously we can't uh, yeah. spend too much time on on them all. So uh, we want to be, you know, want to make sure we're uh, you know, moving along and, uh, you know, that way we can get through as much as we can uh, in the time yeah. allotted here. So, The following chapter, you also, you talked about reproductive rights. Uh, would you like to talk about, you know, what you think reproductive rights are and how you explain that? Yeah. So yeah. I think this term is kind of a euphemism. Uh, that is to say, typically what it means is not actually what you think it would mean. So reproduction for human beings takes place um, at conception. In other words, at conception, you, the couple has actually reproduced a new human being. Now, af after that, then the question is, well, what's going to happen? And sometimes after conception, if you have in vitro fertilization, then the embryo might be frozen. The embryo might be put in a surrogate mother. 
the embryo might be put into the, the body of the woman who donated the egg. So there's lots of different options. Um, and then aside from in vitro fertilization, if just after uh, normal active intercourse, there's conception, you have a new human being. But the term reproductive rights often is used to mean not actually the right to reproduce, but rather the right to end a uh, new human life that already has been reproduced. And so part of what I was trying to get at in that chapter is again, that we use language that's accurate. And the euphemism reproductive rights as a euphemism to mean uh, abortion is, is a euphemistic use of terminology. In other words, it's concealing, not revealing the reality of what actually is going on. And so in that chapter, what I wanted to do is sort of highlight and make very clear actually what reproductive rights, at least if you took the term literally, what it actually would mean. Hmm. You're right. And you talk about in there uh, the difference in thinking about rights, the difference between a liberty right and a claim right. Would you mind explaining that? Sure, sure. Um, a liberty right is a right of non-interference. For instance, it would be like my right to free speech. Uh, I have a liberty right to free speech, which means that the government shouldn't arrest me if I, you know, write something or if I, uh, you know, give a speech or something. Now, there are some limits to freedom of speech, but the basic idea would be if you have a liberty right, that means that others have a duty not to interfere with what you're doing. Uh, by contrast, a claim right is when others do have a responsibility to provide something for you. So, for instance, um, a claim right would be uh, the right to health care would be an example of a claim right. So if I have a right to health care, what that means is other people, the government or a company or whoever, other people have a duty to give me health care. So what are reproductive rights? Well, I don't think they can be a claim right because in order to reproduce, at least for human beings, you need another person to cooperate with you, right? No man just alone as a man and no woman just alone as a woman can reproduce. So I don't see how you could have a claim right to reproduction in the sense of, you know, that, that if I want to reproduce, there's some woman out there who's going to be forced to reproduce with me. Or if a woman out there wants to reproduce, there's a man out there that's going to be forced to donate sperm to her or have sex with her. So I don't think it can be a claim right. Um, is it a liberty right that no one should get in the way of you reproducing? Um, well, that I'm not sure about either. I mean, is it the case that, I mean, okay, yeah, is it a case that you have a, a liberty right to reproduction? Well, I'm not sure because given that there's other people that have to cooperate with you, I don't think it could be something that you alone can bring about. So it's not like free speech. So if I want to give a talk, if I want to stand in a corner and start talking, um, that's something I can do alone. But reproduction isn't, and so it can't be a liberty right either. So basically, I don't think reproductive rights would fall under either a claim right or a liberty right, properly speaking. Now, uh, libertarians often speak of positive and, and negative rights. This would just kind of be a, a different way of framing that same idea, right? Um, hmm. I think so. I think so. So the, the idea would be a positive right would be a claim right, and that would be that other people have a responsibility to give you something. Right, and a negative like right, right is a right liberty. where... Oh, right, similar to a liberty right, where no one can prevent you from doing it, but they don't necessarily have to provide the thing in question. Yes, I, I, I want to think about that more, but I think mm -hmm. I think if I understand you right, I think the answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you move on from there to talk about uh, going from reproductive rights to reproductive duties. Um, and I thought that was a very... It's something that I notice a lot of people miss is the idea that we have obligations based on our rights. And uh, I wonder if you could briefly, you know, just summarize that. Yeah. So I do think that there is in general this sort of correlation between rights and duties. So, for instance, the the free speech, the right to free speech that I have does, in fact, entail duties on other people's parts. In other words, if I have a right to free speech, that means, say, the government has a duty not to stop me from speaking, not to interfere with my speech, say. Or if I have a right to live, that is another way of saying that others have a duty not to intentionally kill me. So I think rights and duties really do go together. Now, when you speak about reproductive rights, um, I find it troubling that so many people talk about reproductive rights, but very few people talk about reproductive duties. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to think about that. So 
human beings as a species enter life very immature. That is to say, all human infants are in need of care. And the research shows very clearly that human infants do best if they have a mother and a father who are married, who are both caring for the child in question. So if we think about the duties of um, uh, the duties of parents for children, it seems to me that that's much more fundamental than the rights of parents over children. So let me put that a different way. I think that the the rights of people, uh, the parental rights, are grounded in and limited by parental duties. So why do I have rights over my own kids? Why can I decide where they go to school, say, and you can't? Well, the reason is that I have a duty to my kids to do what I think is best for them. I have a duty to raise them. And therefore, because I have duties to raise them and take care of them and provide for them, that gives me rights to determine, say, which grade school my kids go to or which high school my kids go to. So I think many times when we talk about reproductive rights, the duties are completely forgotten. And in a way, the reproductive rights or the parental rights end up trumping the duties. So for instance, there are authors who would say things like, um, well, because uh, parental rights are, uh, because a, a person who has a child has parental rights, that gives them the right to, say, terminate the life of, you know, the child if it's in an ectogenesis chamber or something. But I think that's, again, kind of confusing the relationship between parental duties and parental rights. In other words, if you are a parent, then you have parental duties. And the parental duty is primarily to care for your own kid and especially not to intentionally harm your own child. But if but if that is the parental duty, that duty, uh, you might say, orders or limits any parental rights you have. So in other words, my parental rights definitely don't include things that harm my own kids, right? I don't have parental rights to do that. Um, so I think that, yeah, the, the, the way in which parental duties are sometimes forgotten about actually distorts a proper discussion of what parental rights are. Okay. Now, I, I think that's a good, uh, that'll be a good segue into the next segment, uh, responding to, uh, sorry, I've turned to the wrong chapter. Uh, you mentioned about the issue of ectogenesis and uh, whether or not parental duties res uh, restrict our right to kill the human being who is in the, the artificial womb. In your uh, chapter, in chapter seven, you address that issue, the, is there a right to the death of the fetus, uh, where you're responding to, is it June Rashanin? We were trying to work out the pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, Nathan, I actually don't know how, how to pronounce oh. this name properly. We were hoping you would, but. Uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. Um, I've never, I've emailed with him before, but I actually have never talked to him, so I don't know okay. exactly how to pronounce his name properly. Yeah, well, Anyways, he actually gave what I think might be one of the most creative arguments for abortion that I've ever heard. Um, yeah. Actually, Clinton was the first one who told me about this when we went to the March for Life back in January. Um, this idea of genetic rights or I have a right as a genetic parent, uh, that's what grounds my rights. And so I honestly thought it was one of the most creative arguments I've ever heard. I think it actually is, doesn't work at all, but I will give him points for creativity on that. Uh, so, Juno Rashanin, um, wonder if you could summarize his arguments and then your responses to them. Um, yeah, I think again, I'd like to cite exactly what he says, just to to be precise about what he says. So his argument is given on um, on page sixty seven of my book, and it says this: the right, the fetus is property of the genetic parents, and then secondly, people can destroy their property. And then thirdly, the conclusion, therefore, genetic parents can destroy their fetus. Um, so the first thing I want to say about that argument is that it's logically invalid. Uh, it is an example of an argument with more than three terms. And so even if both premises were true, the conclusion still doesn't follow. Um, so that's the first thing to say about it. But moreover, I think both of these uh, premises are false. The first premise that the fetus is property of the genetic parents is false. So you're talking about genetic parents, right? So yeah. if you are a parent, that means you have a child, right? You can't, you, you know, no one can be, a, no individual can be a parent unless they have a child. But if you have a child, if you have a son or daughter, I think it's uh, 
unbelievable distortion of the parental relationship to think about your own son or daughter as if they are just your property. I think that's completely wrongheaded. My son, my daughter, is not my property. No, they're an individual human being, and they're my son or daughter. So I think we should respect and protect all human beings. But as a father, I have a special duty and a special obligation to respect and protect and indeed to aid my own son or daughter. So to characterize my son or daughter as property that I can dispose of as I wish for my own convenience, I think is incredibly wrongheaded. Mm-hmm. But the second premise yeah, is also yeah. wrong. People can destroy their own property. That's also uh, not the case. There are many cases where someone might own something which they, in fact, do not have a moral or legal right to destroy it. So imagine somebody who owns um, Michelangelo's uh, Pieta, right? You're the Vatican. And they say, well, we own this this statue, and so we have a right to destroy it. We're just going to blow it up tomorrow. I would say that would be seriously wrong to destroy a valuable work of art like that. Why? Well, even if you own this valuable work of art, the proper response to a thing of beauty is not to just blow it up and destroy it just because you happen to own it. Hmm. Secondly, that work of art has unbelievable historical value. And so there's something deeply uh, wrongheaded about destroying things that have tremendous historical value. But I would say the same thing is true of every human being, that all human beings are, in a sense, a work of art. At least if you think that all human beings have intrinsic dignity, that's another way of saying that all human beings are intrinsically valuable. You might put that in a poetic form to say that all human beings are worthwhile and lovable and ought to be celebrated and respected uh, rather than destroyed. But I would say it's particularly true when the human being you're talking about is your own son or daughter. There's a special obligation I, I think personally that I ought to respect everyone, but there's a special obligation to respect my own son and daughter. So this this minor premise, people can destroy their own property, seems to me uh, seems to me quite wrongheaded. So basically, I think the argument fails because it's logically invalid and because both the major premise and the minor premise are false. But other than that, the argument's great. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Greg Kokel uh, asked the question. You know, what, you know, if if, some, if your daughter comes up to you and asks, "Can I kill this?" Uh, your your first question should be, "What is it?" Before you say yes. And I think that I think it applies even to this argument that uh, it, if something is your property, you still have to determine what it is before you can determine whether yeah. or not you have the moral right to destroy it. You know, I was thinking what you just mentioned. I mean, I think everybody can agree, like. Um, a teenage son who uh, is very affluent. Uh, he goes out and wrecks his car that his parents bought him. Uh, I think we can all agree he did some. Uh, he did wrong in some way by destroying his car, even though it was his property. Um, everybody looks at that and they say, no, that um, he, he doesn't have a right to go out and just wreck his car like that. I mean, um, I think you mentioned in the book, I believe you quote Thomas Aquinas that, you know, it's very irrational to destroy our own property or property we've been entrusted with. And you know, behaving irrationally is also immoral. I mean, um, we're behaving against our nature as rational beings by behaving irrationally and, say, destroying our sports car, destroying if somebody owns one of Michelangelo's works of art, destroying that. So uh, that was just kind of the thought that came to mind when you were mentioning um, why his second premise fails. And then I was also just thinking with it, I'm going, you know, why does this argument only work for terms of the fetus? Why doesn't it work for, say, parents of a teenager? They're fed up with their teenager, wouldn't that justify killing at their teenager? I mean, it's their genetic property. Uh, why wouldn't it work in that sense? Or to give you an example, let's say that we have a um, twin, you have a genetic twin. So you would yeah. share totally with that person's you know, DNA. Um, but I don't think there's any reason to think that you have a right to destroy your genetic twin just because yeah. the twin has your DNA. So the fact that some other human being shares some of your DNA or even all your DNA in the case of genetic twins seems completely irrelevant to whether or not you have a right to intentionally kill that human being. Um, And in the article, uh, I don't think that the author I was criticizing establishes uh, that say the fetus is not a person or doesn't have any rights. It's, it's sort of assumed, uh, but that obviously is a huge assumption that I reject. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was something else that kind of struck me as a little bit odd as I was going, you know, I mean, it wouldn't it make any di- would it make any difference if, you know, the fetus was a person? Well, if they were, then it seems kind of odd to say, well, we can kill them anyways because they're genetic property. I was thinking I'm going, that doesn't sound like a very good enough reason, honestly. Um, 
When also, yeah, if, the fetus yeah, is a person, if the fetus is a person, I would say the fetus is therefore also not property. Yeah. I mean, to be property means you're just a thing, right? To be property yeah. means that you're owned by someone else. But I mean, I, I, unless you're going to justify slavery, I don't think any human being is owned mm. by anybody. We're, we're not, no one is anyone's property. Yeah. Right? That's just to, mis it's to, make, to, it's to make a category a mistake to confuse uh, human beings with things, to confuse mm -hmm. persons with property. I would say no, no, no human being is a thing. No individual human being is anyone's property. So I think the whole argument doesn't really get off the ground uh, unless we presuppose that there are some human beings that aren't really persons. There are some human beings that really, really are things at the end of the day, at least should be treated as if they're things. But that's something that, for reasons that we've talked about already, um, I reject. Yeah. Now, sorry, Clinton, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, we've got about uh, seven minutes left. Did you want to tackle another one of these arguments, or did you want to hit up, hit up the uh, end of life argument you wanted to talk about? Uh, I actually did want to talk about one more argument, at least. Um, in chapter, uh, I believe it's in chapter six, uh, we kind of mentioned it already, The uh, um, what was called the pro-life paradox, where, you know, if you, you know, you Christians, why do you oppose abortion? Because, you know, the child who's killed in abortion, they'll just go right to heaven. Now, it's interesting. I actually heard this argument about six, seven years ago. A friend of mine told it to me, and she goes, you know, uh, she said, you know, why do you, if you believe in like an age of accountability, why do you have such a problem with abortion? I go, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, if the child's killed before they are reached that age of accountability, they go right to heaven. So you spared them an entire life of pain and suffering. And I'm going, and at the time I was kind of thinking, I'm going, gosh, I think she got me there. Uh, so it, it's an argument I've heard more at the lay level. I was really surprised that somebody uh, took it up in the academic literature. Because, uh, I mean, it's one that I've heard online, just trolls will say, well, yeah. you know, it means about it. And they're like, oh, well, why do you oppose abortion? It sends babies to God faster. And I'm like, oh, come on, really? So I'm, I'm glad you, you tackled it in your chapter. I thought it was a really good response. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard it. But I think that the argument basically is trying to say that Christians are inconsistent, right? That they have the view that abortion's wrong and the view that... Uh, if a child before the age of reason dies, the child goes to heaven. And I think that, that those two things are totally consistent. Um, so for instance, um, I guess I, I don't want to speak for all Christians, but Catholics at least believe that if an adult gets baptized, that that takes away the sin of the, of the adult, and that if the person were to die right after baptism, then they would go to heaven. But nobody thinks that, oh, therefore murdering somebody right after they get baptized is perfectly fine because they're gonna to go to heaven. Now, what's the problem with doing that? Well, the problem in part is that we can't do evil so that good may come of it. So Christian ethics is, you might say, anti-utilitarian. Utilitarianism would wanna say that whatever act brings about the greatest happiness for the greatest number is morally permissible, even if that act is enslaving someone or judicially executing an innocent person or torturing a little child to death or whatever. Um, Christianity rejects that kind of consequentialist reasoning and says that because human beings have an innate dignity, no human being can be used simply as a means to achieve any end. And that would include means of sal the end of salvation. So should you lie in order to help someone be saved? Well, Augustine's answer is no, that we ought not to lie in order to help someone be saved. Uh, Aquinas considers the question, should we tear open a pregnant woman uh, whose pregnancy is endangered to baptize the uh, fetus before the baby dies. And Aquinas says, no, we ought not to kill the pregnant woman in order to secure salvation. So at least in Christian teaching, there's a number of actions that should never be done. Mm -hmm. Among those actions are intentionally killing the innocent. And so we ought not to intentionally kill the innocent, even to secure a good end. Um, so these are, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, so these are, these are questions that, that Christian thinkers have been anticipating for quite some time then. Hundreds of years. <laughs> yeah, so Aquinas obviously is writing about uh, 700 years ago and Augustine more than 1,000 years ago. So, yeah, I think a lot of people who who charge this, or at least the author I was looking at, his name's uh, Dan Thomas, if I remember, um, I think that he could make this argument only because he had an incredibly shallow understanding of Christianity. And so it appeared to him after this sort of first reading that, oh, there's a big contradiction here. But I, in fact, think 
that if you understand the Christian tradition better, there is no contradiction at all. Yeah. So it would be a little bit like accusing the U.S. Constitution of a contradiction because you read a contradiction in two clauses of the Constitution, whereas the contradiction is later answered in, you know, some further clause in the Constitution. So yeah. there's not a real contradiction unless you isolate these two things and misinterpret them. And then there's a then there's a contradiction. But that's not a real contradiction at all. Right. And, you know, I was also thinking that it does it completely ignores Christian teaching on the issue of salvation and honestly on what our purpose as human beings are. Uh, you mentioned in your chapter, you refer to the Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church's catechism. I was thinking of the Westminster Catechism as well, where it says, you know, what is man, the chief goal and end of mankind is, well, it's to love God and enjoy him forever. And I was thinking, I'm going, you know, that's the whole reason why God gives us a life in the first place is so we can love him and enjoy him forever. And so I was thinking even there's another reason why it would be wrong is because you kill somebody, you take, took away the life that God ordained for them to have in the first place. Um, so the argument even ignores that. I think that's right. It also ignores, even if you had a kind of consequentialist view where you say, well, all that matters is salvation. Um, it, even then, you wouldn't really know whether any particular killing, in fact, does advance salvation. Yeah. In other words, if the person you killed would have been the next Mother Teresa, would have been the next Billy Graham, would have been the next John Paul II. Well, you have thereby uh, inhibited the salvation of thousands, maybe even millions of people. So, yeah, I think the argument really doesn't work, uh, yeah. really doesn't work at all um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, right. That, uh, reminds me of a, of a joke I once heard. Uh, what is the chief end of man? His head. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Okay. So we're we're coming up to the end of our time here together. Um, is there some? Do you have an online presence where people can find you? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I think my handle's Kaiser Doc or Kaiser Dr. And then I'm on Facebook. If you just Google or not, if you put my name in Facebook, you can you can find me there. But you know, it's funny. I am not that engaged with social media. I guess. Sometimes I think maybe I should be, but uh, I guess part of me, the bigger part of me thinks, oh, do I really want to get out there and do that? I don't know. So I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out what the best use of my time is and the hmm. most helpful thing for other people would be. But so far, yeah. I, I'm not super engaged. You'll hear a lot more of these trollish arguments if you spend more time online. <laughs> yeah, he's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, think it's, I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. I know I have a friend, uh, Professor Robert George, who's very active on Twitter. And I actually really enjoy reading what he has to say, yeah. and, it, and it really helps me, and I think it's informative. So then I think, well, maybe I should do that. And then other times I think, no, <laughs> I don't want to mess with that. So anyway, I, I am out there, but I'm not uh, as active as my friend Robbie George. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, thank you uh, for coming on and, and talking about your book with us, uh, Dr. Kayser. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Clinton. I'm very grateful to both of you for uh, right. making time for me and for your questions and comments. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Keep up your good work. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And uh, you know, a couple of advantages with uh, with StreamYard is that number one, the sound quality is a lot better than going through Block Talk Radio. But we also don't have to just you know hang up on our guest as soon as we end the broadcast. <laughs> so if, yeah. if you can just if you just sit tight for a moment, uh, Chris, we'll we'll uh, end here and then we'll we'll say you know our our, our goodbyes here in a moment. Yeah. So to the listener, thank you for, for joining us. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate you if you, especially if you enjoyed the interview, you could share us around social media, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you frequent. We've, we've had a lot of uh, vote bombers by pro-choice people who obviously have not uh, listened to the podcast at all. So if you have a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind just going and, and leaving us a favorable review, you know, I won't ask you to, to lie or if, if you're, you know, uh, if there. If, you know, I, I want to ask you to say something that you don't mean, but if you could uh, just help us to kind of combat these uh, these obvious votes that uh, from people have never listened, uh, we'd appreciate that. But if not, you know, we, we still appreciate your listening. And um, once again, if if you uh, would uh, if you would consider uh, becoming a uh, financial supporter, you can always go to uh, the block the uh, pro life thing. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Life Training Institute. Yeah, that's who I work for. Uh, the Life Training yeah. Institute uh, website, prolifetraining.com. You can find the donate uh, button on the menu at the top. You can just put my name in, in the notes section so they know to apply it to my account. And donations are tax deductible. And as we talked about before, the uh, donations are received from the podcast here. You know, go toward all kinds of things, uh, books to keep up with the literature, uh, you know, 
possibly along the lines we may get a, a studio at some point, uh, but it does help for equipment and for um, for hosting the pod, the podcast on Blog Talk Radio. And there's even a, a paid uh, subscription we can get to StreamYard to kind of improve the uh, you know the the look and and things of the uh, of the podcast here on youtube so if, if you you know if you can afford it if, uh, if not uh don't feel obligated we appreciate you having we appreciate having you here uh the the podcast will always remain free so don't don't ever feel obligated to uh to financially support so once again uh we want to thank you for joining us and um we'll see you in the next one